Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. It's really a pleasure to be here and I, I love to interact with clinicians about this topic that I have cared a lot about since really as a medical student. I, I had this interest in, in HIV. I did some work in, in Africa in the early 2000s, but then really fell in love with cardiology. And so for the past eight or nine years, I've been in Cleveland where I ran a similar cardiology clinic in the special immunology unit, the HIV clinic at university hospitals in Cleveland. And so I uh, wanted to do something very similar here. I'm excited to get plugged into the ecosystem of HIV care here in the Pacific Northwest. I'll, I'll get started. And, and the title of the talk here is ASCVD Risk Prediction to Guide Initial Statin Therapy for People Living with HIV. And so we'll focus on, on that today. And I think there are many other topics that you may want to discuss. We can discuss those if we have time, or I can come back for another, another visit. Here is the funding acknowledgement and my disclosures here. Esperian Pharmaceuticals makes a product, Bempidoic Acid, which is a non-statin cholesterol drug that I won't really be talking much about, but just so you are aware. All right, so I'm going to begin today with an exercise that I hope you'll find inspiring, which I think illustrates the opportunity that we have to really make a difference for our patients. And we're going to start with two patients on your panel. We'll call uh, the guy on the left, Greg, and the guy on the right there, Bill. Greg here is 50 years old. He's uh, had AIDS since 2002 on ART ever since then, and had a, a low Nader CD4 count at the time of diagnosis, but that has risen to 600 now. We'll look at Bill over here on the other side, who's also 50, has had HIV not quite as long, or at least not diagnosed quite as long, but that was picked up on, on routine screening, has been on ART, but as a result of not having as advanced disease, his Nader CD4 count was 600 current CD4 count of 1,000. So which one of these patients is at higher risk for cardiovascular disease? Well, I think we need some more information, right? Now, both of them smoke, uh, as many of our patients do, although that, that rate is also declining over time. Greg here on, on the left has a blood pressure of 140 over 70 on amlodipine and an LDL cholesterol of 100 on a torvastatin 40. Whereas Bill on the right has a blood pressure that's normal off meds and uh, a similar LDL on a torvastatin 40. So now who's at higher risk? I think many of you would recognize that Greg over here on the left is the one at higher risk because he has had HIV for a longer time. He had a lower Nader C4 count, uh, but also has uncontrolled blood pressure. But the kicker is this, Sam in the middle here is actually HIV negative, also 50 years old, but because he doesn't have a chronic disease, he's really not engaged in, in primary care. And, and so he smokes, but has a blood pressure of 150 over 90, not on medications, not being treated, and an LDL cholesterol of 160 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So who's at higher risk now? I would argue that it's really Sam. And so the, the, the point of this exercise is to say that because our patients are engaged in care with us, we have an opportunity, if we're thinking about it, to treat the risk factors, blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, that can really have an impact on reducing their risk of cardiovascular disease. With that, we'll begin with a case which I think has many things packed into it. We're going to focus today on, on primary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events. Uh, but there are some other things in here that we might come back to if you're interested. So this is a 59-year-old gentleman with HIV, his current CD4 count of 800, who's undetectable on dolotegravir and Trivada, and an avid, avid smoker who uh, initially saw me for palpitations. His workup for palpitations was really unrevealing, and so I discharged him from my clinic, but uh, his primary HIV doc ordered a low-dose chest CT for lung cancer, and it showed three-vessel coronary calcification, one of those qualitative findings that you sometimes see. He's back to see me, and on, on further questioning, he clearly has some dyspnea on exertion and, and has noticed in the past several months a modest decrease in his exercise tolerance. His risk factors for ASCVD include smoking, the, 
50 pack year history, currently one pack per day. High cholesterol is shown here with a total cholesterol of 178 and LDL of 95. And his father had bypass surgery at 60, which technically is not an early ASCVD event, but nonetheless, something to consider. Again, besides his ART, he is on atorvastatin, but only a, a, a lower dose, atorvastatin 20, on ion testosterone and uh, an albuterol. His blood pressure off meds is 142 over 80. And of note, his creatinine and other chemistries are normal, normal LFTs. Okay. So again, lots to talk about, but the question here is, what do we do with this three-vessel coronary calcification that was seen on the low-dose chest CT, and uh, where do we go from there? So we'll, we'll get to that, but I'd like to review a little bit the approach to cholesterol treatment as outlined by the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. So you may know that in 2018, which is the most recent uh, cholesterol guidelines update, the writers of the guidelines identified four key groups, those with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, who are further divided into those who are very high risk and those who are just high risk, those with a high LDL, those with diabetes, and then everyone else between age 40 and 75, you use a, a risk estimator to, to identify those who may be at uh, additional risk. And you can see that the recommendations for treatment are slightly different depending on which group you might fall into. So let's talk about calculating risk. This is the pooled cohorts equations at ASCVD risk calculator. Many of you are very familiar with, hopefully, and you can see all the risk factors and, and variables that go in here. There is a race term. We can again, talk about that later. Uh, if people are interested, given that there's some interest in, in maybe considering removing that. But you can see the other traditional risk factors that go into the equation. And for our patient, his calculated or estimated 10-year ASCVD risk is 16.8%. Uh, so ASCVD events here are defined as non-fatal MI, coronary heart disease, death, or stroke. Um, and so that's what we're trying to prevent. Now, what do we know about HIV infection and, and people living with HIV? This analysis from Matt Feinstein and colleagues in JAMA Cardiology showed that in the Scenics cohort, and you may know you dubbed as the Scenics Coordinating Center, the risk, the observed risk, for, particularly for Black men and Black women, was actually higher than the expected risk using the ACC AHA pooled cohort equations. Now, this is in contrast to most studies in the general population that have shown that the ASCVD risk calculator over has a tendency to overestimate risk. But particularly in this analysis, in Black men and women, but also in, in white men and women, it was actually under predicted risk. So how do we then tailor risk calculators, perhaps, in, for an HIV population? Lots of people have been trying to think about this. And the Europeans in particular, the DAD study, has had a calculator that's been out there. I don't know how many of you may be familiar with it, but at this uh, URL here, you can plug in a bunch of different things that are uh, HIV specific variables and based on their cohort data can estimate a risk of a, a, a five and 10 year ASCV uh, event. And so uh, again, with a slightly different definition of CVD, but very similar, the five year risk is 8.24% or about a 16 and a half percent risk. So again, very, very similar to what was predicted by the pooled cohort equation. Now note here, this is for individuals age 18 to 75, whereas the ASCVD risk calculator is 40 to 75, with a caveat of cumulative NRTI exposure of up to about eight to 10 years and PI exposure up to around five to six years. There's also a version that does not include ART, it's only uh, includes CD4 count. If you want to, to look at that in this patient, um, that risk was calculated at 8%. All right, so we're does our patient fit then? What do you do with someone who has an intermediate risk between seven and a half to 20%, but has never had a previous ASCVD event? This algorithm would suggest that you initiate a moderate intensity statin. Now, importantly, even patients with a borderline risk, five to 7%, seven and a half percent, you might consider initiating statin therapy 
because of these risk enhancers shown over here. And I'll point out that for the first time in the guidelines in 2018, HIV was specifically called out. So these are the specific recommendations for adults with chronic inflammatory disorders and HIV. You can see here, again, 2A recommendations with level of evidence B. And, and that's that in adults 40 to 75 uh, and an LDL between 70 and 190 who have a risk greater than seven and a half percent, HIV would certainly favor initiating at least moderate or high intensity statins. Our patient doesn't really have clinical ASCVD in the sense that he's never had a heart attack or stroke, but as we'll talk about, the definition of clinical ASCVD is, is potentially changing. And as we do much more CT coronary angiography and find subclinical disease, people are starting to think about putting them into this category. But for secondary prevention, we really want to categorize people as at not very high risk or very high risk. And because it's not the the topic uh, today, we'll, we'll kind of gloss over this a little bit. These are the things that make someone very high risk, major ASCVD events, recurrent ASCVD events, peripheral arterial disease, and other high-risk conditions. And just to, to acknowledge that the National Lipid Association has put out HIV-specific guidelines. I was part of a panel in 2015 that put these out and, and uh, suggested that HIV should be considered a risk factor for the purposes of establishing a target LDL or non-HDL cholesterol goal. So you can pretty quickly get to three or more risk factors if you consider HIV a risk factor, which would mean treating someone to an LDL cholesterol less than 100 or non-HDL less than 130. And in our patient, a non-HDL cholesterol, again, simply the total cholesterol minus HDL was 140, so still not quite at goal if you consider these guidelines. So in 2018, the guidelines recommended considering the use of coronary artery calcium to further differentiate risk if you need to, if a patient is hesitant about taking a, a higher dose statin or you as a clinician have a concern about initiating a higher dose statin. So what is a calcium score? This is a non-contrast, but ECG gated CT scan of the chest. It can differentiating it from a low dose scan for lung cancer, for example. And that gets rid of the movement of the heart so that you can look at the coronary arteries more specifically. Um, again, because it doesn't have IV contrast, it's different than CT angiography. And the result is typically expressed as an Agatston score or CAC score. And you can see that with CAC scores greater than 400, your risk for an ASCVD event is quite high to the point that many of these patients may benefit from even more aggressive prevention measures besides statin therapy. In this study, you can see that if you consider risk factors alone, risk discrimination is not really that great, but the addition of cardiac CT, whether it be CAC or calcium plus CT angiography is really pretty remarkable. And you can increase the C statistic or the area under the ROC curve um, substantially for future events. So let's go back to the case and discuss any additional workup. So I decided because there was calcium on the low-dose lung cancer screening scan to get a dedicated calcium score. And the total was 1490. Again, 400 is our threshold for high, right? So this is very high with a lot of disease in the LAB. And so we decided that it would be very reasonable to just treat this person medically if, if you wanted to. But because of his dyspnea, we were concerned, is this a dyspnea angina equivalent or that sort of thing? So we did invasive coronary angiography and showed he had substantial disease in his LAD, but also his RCA. So then what did we do? Initially, we opted for medical management because we know that stents are not the cure for all of these patients, even those with significant disease and significant uh, ischemia potentially. So we added aspirin 81, but also Plavix after a discussion of the risk and benefit of uh, bleeding risk and that sort of thing. Increased his atorvastatin to 80 and started him on a cocktail of beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and calcium channel blocker to see if that would improve his symptoms. And then the plan was if his symptoms were poorly controlled to consider revascularization. And there's a lot that we could discuss about revascularization, but I think is a topic for another day. PCI versus cabbage, 
again, kind of beyond the scope of today. But regardless of what we did, shared decision making is always really important. There are tools that exist to help you with this with your patients. And I'll, I have a couple here, obviously the, the ASCVD risk estimator, but this statin decision aid from the Mayo, Mayo Clinic I find to be very useful. I'll show you an example on the next slide. It's important that we emphasize lifestyle factors with our patients first so that they don't get the impression we're just pushing medicines, right? And, and to involve patients in discussion of the costs of therapy and make sure that our patients feel heard, have a chance to ask questions, and then ultimately own the decision that is made. So I've used this tool, which is a very nice way of showing the ASCVD risk if you have uh, 100 patients exactly like you over the next 10 years, and this is someone with an ASCVD risk of 11%, 11 of them will have a heart attack. And if you start a statin, we can reduce that risk for those people who might not have a heart attack. What about statin intensity? So what constitutes a moderate intensity statin? You can see here resuvastatin and atorvastatin at um, these doses um, is typically where I'll start but then going to high intensity if needed. It's important to recommend, or recognize that pravastatin, which has been used a lot over the years when there were a lot of drug interactions, is really only a moderate intensity statin. I'll say just a few words because I know we we're, we're, want to wrap up here about the cov cystat PI interaction. I do use a torvastatin primarily in these patients and start at 10, potentially titrating to a max of 40, Sometimes I get a little nervous with 40, so stick to 20, but um, you have to measure or monitor symptoms and an LDL response. There's a small interaction with resuvastatin, so again, limit to a max dose of 20. However, if there's a compelling indication for a high dose statin, I think it's important to think about switching the ART if that's possible. And then if the ART cannot be switched and you're still not willing to, to use a torvastatin or resuvastatin, to consider patavastatin or pravastatin as alternatives. So I'll end with these clinical pearls, and that is that initial risk stratification for people living with HIV is to use a risk calculator, as I've talked about, uh, because again, what is the purpose of estimating uh, absolute risk? It's that the, the absolute risk reduction of therapies obviously depends on their baseline absolute risk, because the relative risk reduction of statins and other medicines is really very similar across most subpopulations. In my opinion, I think using the ACCHA ACVD risk calculator is the most useful in US populations, but uh, we can talk more about that if, if you want to. And again, cardiac CT is emerging as a gold standard for helping to further risk stratify people if you need to, to, to decide on, on further aggressive therapy. And I'll end there. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.